Chapter 9 Rookie Mistakes Donovan Sleed, the assigned leader to the DS team tasked with killing one man trapped in a canyon, was now painfully aware of three very serious mistakes. Mistake number one. Their basic understanding that this was some simple civilian, unarmed, possibly wounded from a car wreck, and probably scared out of his mind, had led them to drop their guard. While his team and he understood that killing a man was always a serious matter, their assumption that this was going to be a walk in the park had allowed mistakes to happen, specifically mistakes number two and three. Mistake number two. Their nonchalant approach to this mission had allowed one of their men to go missing for nearly 45 minutes before discovering the fact. They had not found him, and he was not answering the radio. Their prey had, at the very least, incapacitated a DS soldier and was now roaming the woods armed with a military-grade rifle, sidearm, and a radio. Mistake number three. They should always assume that their target might have skills or experience that could present a serious threat, whether that target was armed or not, whether that target was severely outnumbered or not. They didn't. On entering the last section of the canyon, it became painfully obvious that their target was an avid and proficient shooter. Steel targets had been strategically placed throughout, and the impact marks told Donovan that their target appreciated the skill of focusing on the headshot. He may or may not be former military, but Donovan was very familiar with the three-gun obstacle course that crossed from one side of the valley to the other. Their target was likely in pretty good physical shape from the running required on a gun-filled obstacle course and was familiar with shooting at targets and reloading on the move. Not exactly the skill set one would imagine being possessed by a backwoods ranch hand. Sleed, as he preferred to be called, was a former Army Ranger. He made it to the rank of sergeant before being accused of sexually assaulting a female soldier. The evidence was not strong enough to send him to jail, but the colonel in charge of the court-martial was pretty sure he was guilty. As such, he was barred to re-enlist due to his questionable record and possessing a history of disrespecting superior officers. After that, he eventually came in contact with Big Chuck, while serving as a bouncer at one of his bars. He impressed the guy with his casual sense of brutality towards people that needed to be thrown out, and was recruited into the DS. He was a big man. He stood six foot seven in his socks, and weighed in at almost 300 pounds. His head was shaved smooth, and he wore a deep red, well-groomed beard and mustache, clinging to his rock-like face. His ample-sized hands that se sized hands that seemed to always be balled into a fist, along with the rest of his imposing features, usually meant people avoided him everywhere he went. If he walked down a street, people approaching him from the opposite direction always seemed to cross the road. When he walked into a bar, he never had to pick his way through the crowd. They just parted like the Red Sea before Moses. And here he was looking like he was a rookie lieutenant on his first command. Anger burned through him, and he really needed to hurt someone. He checked his watch and saw 7.15 on the face. From the west, the sun was already going down beyond the mountains, and soon this entire valley would be thrown into gloomy twilight. He gathered his men around and ordered them to go into chase mode protocol at 7.30 to minimize being eavesdropped on by the enemy. Team 1 was out of reach, so he directed two of his men to run back to the cabin as quick as they could on the road to notify the others of the radio change. They were then to stay and reinforce that end of the canyon. The two took off at a quick trot to carry out his orders. There was a total of 300 channels on the state-of-the-art digital radios, and they had a practice procedure should their radios become compromised, like now. They would reset to channel 1 and hit a special button called Chase Mode, on the next quarter hour. The radios had built-in clocks that were synced prior to leaving for any mission. If everyone hit the chase button at the same time, the radios would, in unison, jump through the channels at pre-programmed intervals every five minutes. The radios would jump to channel five, for example, and then exactly five minutes later, it would jump to maybe channel 12. Five minutes after that, it would jump to another seemingly random channel, and so on. If you did not hit the chase button on your radio along with everyone else at the exact same time, it was prob probable 
that you would never catch up. He had the rest of his men all fall back to the cabin. He had to update Mason and the others waiting there in person. At 7.30, the next quarter hour, they would have all had their radios synchronized to chase mode, and they could go back to secure communications. The next thing he had to do was comb through the cabin and see if he could learn anything about this guy. By all accounts, they still had the extreme upper hand, but he needed to make sure it stayed that way. They were only down one man, but their adversary was now armed, and that changed everything. It was best to see what they could learn about him and make sure that there were no more mistakes. As lead on this op, he was the only one allowed to have a cell phone. This was a tactic employed in case any of them were captured or killed by law enforcement. If the FBI were able to break into a captured cell phone, who knows what treasure trove of evidence might be uncovered, especially the fancy little smartphone to keep the NSA or anyone else from listening in on their phone calls. This also meant that their target was not able to call out for help. Even though their target had nailed one of their guys, he wasn't able to confiscate a cell phone off the lost man. So even though he was armed and had apparently taken out one of their own, he was trapped between here and the highway with no way to call in the cops. He considered notifying Big Chuck to let him know what was going on, but decided against it. If he came across as not competent, he might lose his leadership position and he liked the perks that came along with the role. Besides, he still had everything under control. The boxed-in portion of the canyon had now been cleared, and he would have to leave two DS to guard the entrance. There were still five of them guarding the start of the canyon near the road, and they were about to be reinforced with two more. That left 11 DS at the cabin, including him, along with Mason, Mitch, and Pete. With that, and Pete. With that, there was no way this dude was going to escape or hide much longer. Once back at the cabin, he issued more orders. Down on the far end of the field, across from the cabin, was a small stand of aspen on a slight rise along the valley floor. He instructed one of the snipers to set up there and aim back towards the entrance and the tree line. Between the sniper on the porch and the one out in the field, they would have an intersecting field of fire. Additionally, they were both outfitted with thermal scopes. Once the sun went down, if their enemy tried to sneak through or take them out under the cover of darkness, he was going to be in for a rude surprise. Next, Sleed ordered two more of them back to where the dirt road emerged from the forest in front of the cabin. They would set up on the left side and guard that point. From there, they would be able to not only watch the road, but look across it and follow the tree line all the way to the southern wall he and the three others to search the cabin for details about their enemy and wait for night to fully ascend. They would then become a hunting party. Equipped with night vision goggles, they could hunt their way back down through the valley and find this guy. The goggles would render their prey an easy target as he would virtually glow in the dark. They would see him clearly, unable to hide in the shadows, and he would see nothing at all. He would instruct Mason and his friends to hang out at the cabin and stay out of the way. In the dark, it would be easy for one of them to get caught in a crossfire. If one of Big Chuck's got shot in all of this, well, let's just say that it would be an unforgivable mistake. As soon as he got the radios back online and secured from eavesdropping, and that would happen in just a few more minutes, he would let everyone know of his plan and issue one more order. Capturing this guy was now off the table. They needed to kill him as soon as he was spotted. They would just have to deal with the forensic cleanup afterwards. He felt his phone by his pocket. He didn't have to look at the caller ID to know who it would be. Big Chuck was wanting an update. So much for trying to get this done before dealing with the boss. Big Chuck was not going to be pleased with his rookie mistakes.